Well, we have a good one for you tonight. Hello and welcome to Sports Affinity presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, FJMC offers you an opportunity to express yourself through participating in and leading activities that are most important to you. I'm Dave Kravitz with my co-chair, Danny Mando, and we'll be hosting tonight. We're gonna to mute everyone so we can enjoy the presentation, and then we'll be unmuting after presenter's remarks so we can take questions. So now I'm gonna introduce our speaker, Bruce Pearl. This is an honor. First of all, I want to say it's an honor to have Bruce on, and I'm going to start my, my, little, my little spiel here. Bruce was born in Sharon, Mass., and received his bachelor's degree from Boston College in business administration, graduating cum laude. He is coached at Tennessee, Milwaukee, and Southern Indiana. He currently is the head coach at Auburn. Bruce led Southern Indiana to a Division II national championship and named National II Coach of the Year by the National Association of Basketball Coaches. He has won four conference championships and three conference tournament champions as a Division I coach and has made 10 NCAA tournament appearances and one Final Four. Bruce was named Coach of the Year by Sporting News in 2006. He was awarded the Adel Frupp Cup in 2008. He was, he was head coach for the Maccabea U.S. Men's Basketball Team that won the gold medal at the 2009 Maccabea Games. He ranked second among active Southeastern Conference and winning percentage as an NCAA coach at 720. Bruce and his wife, Randy, are committed to giving back to those in Alabama as they have raised over a million dollars in only five golf tournaments at Auburn for Children's Harbor and Birmingham, benefiting children with serious illnesses and their fam families. Bruce started out alive in 2015 and 2016 to benefit cancer patients in the fight to be cancer out alive raises the awareness, cancer prevention and detection. As an ambassador for Auburn University, Bruce's selfless community service work and generous stewardship made him one of the most influential public figures in the states of Alabama and Tennessee. His Hebrew name is Mordechai, named after Queen Esther's uncle in the poem story. And now Bruce Pearl. <laughs> well, David, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's it's so nice to be speaking with my mushpucha. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of that in uh, Auburn, Alabama, I can tell you that. Um, and I know in so many ways I'll be preaching to the choir. Um, so I'm going to introduce yourself. I'm going to introduce myself to you, talk a little bit about growing up in Boston, um, and a little bit about my, my journey as a Jewish basketball coach. First of all, I am a Jewish basketball coach in Alabama. What a great country we live in, right? The best. Um, and this is the land of opportunity. And I tell my players that because um, it wasn't easy for me to get here and it's harder for me to even stay here. And um, yeah, it, thanks. And I want my players uh, to understand uh, that this life is going to have challenges and uh, obstacles, but they're not roadblocks to success. And, and that basically that's kind of what I do. I love my, my uh, family. Um, I love being Jewish. Um, and um, I uh, love the state of Israel and I've done, a, done and, and I've done a lot of things. And I'm doing a lot of things right now uh, to support Israel. And I'll tell you what some of those things are. Um, so born in Boston in 1960, um, experienced, you know, real racism, soft force busing, um, you know, had, had great challenges um, growing up with my Catholic friends, uh, being uh, somebody who was Jewish and obviously known for killing their God, Jesus. Uh, that was tough as a kid growing up. Um, and um but but we dealt with it and we dealt with it on a uh on a, on a pretty regular basis when i was uh you know i was always an athlete i was one of the be better athletes in town um and so in sports um people didn't care what color you were 
and in care. Uh, <coughs> you mean what religion you were? They cared whether you could, how fast you were, whether you could guard somebody or make a shot or, or throw strikes. And I could do all those things. And so I got picked and I was able to participate. And I spent my whole life breaking down stereotypes. I went to Boston College rather than Boston University because there was something in me that recognized that the world kind of looked at my people differently than I looked at my people. Um, I, I learned about a guy named Abraham in my Hebrew school. And uh, Abraham was so willing to trust God that he was willing to sacrifice his, his son, Isaac, like really sacrifice him because God told him to. And I said, that's my religion? I'm in. I I'm all in. And, and Abraham became my kind of my hero, sort of bounced around all over the place, but I thought, okay. Um, I learned to love the state of Israel um, probably the first time was in 1967, of course, the Six-Day War. I was seven years old. My grandfather was a plumber. And uh, he had never watched television, spoke Yiddish, uh, orthodox, wrapped to fill in. Uh, my, one of my goals in life was to finally get bar mitzvah so that I could go to the morning, early morning worship with him um, and wrap to fill in with him which I did for about six months before, unfortunately, he died when he was 63 years old, way too soon. But back in 67, Papa was watching TV one night, and he was crying. My Papa was a tough guy. I never saw him get emotional about anything. I walked up to him and said, Papa, why are you crying? I just remember yesterday. He sat me up in his lap. We watched the television, and the news was on, of course, about the Six-Day War. And it was getting late. Papa went to bed about after sundown because he got up so early to work. I said, Papa, aren't you tired? I can't go to sleep. I'm afraid that when I wake up, Israel won't be there. And then he told me all about his family, that he came to this country from Turnipole when he was just 11 years old. He was the oldest of four children. He brought his three younger brothers and sisters here. His parents sent them. They couldn't afford to send anybody. And they didn't make it. And Papa had said to me, you know, I guess they could have gone and been Zionists and, and gone to Israel before the state was born. But they didn't. They chose to come to this country. And he always felt like if Israel had been born, or maybe they could have gotten there. Okay, I'm in. I mean, I'm, I, 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 mean I was born in Roxbury. Uh, very proud of the Blue Hill Avenue Jews. Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, my dad, my grandmother took me to the GNG, the delicatessen down there. We, you know, we went to the shows down there, the Orient Theater on Blue Hill Avenue. It was so wonderful to grow up at that time because there was so much Jewish life in, in that community. But there were there was challenges, obviously. I'm so glad I got the chance to grow up and see that and feel that. My goodness gracious, anti-Semitism 15 years after the, the gates were open and, uh, and, and we saw 6 million of our brothers and sisters murdered because of how they prayed. Damn, come and get me. Um, and so I've always sort of wanted to leave for that reason. The other thing, again, just going back to learn in Hebrew school that, that uh, you know, when, when, when we were occupying the Romans, and uh, at least these are the stories that I heard, um, we wouldn't bow down to uh, Pharaoh or wouldn't bow down with Caesar. God, again, sign me up. And so, you know, one of the things I do in bringing people together is when I talk about Abraham as the father of all nations. And I, I get what happened back then, but he still loved Ishmael. He says so in the Bible. 
that he was going to make a great nation of him as well. And then I've talked to a lot of Christians who, when they went early to school, not a word about him being Jewish, not a word about him growing up in Israel or, you know, performing his miracles on the Sea of Galilee. I meant a word about it. But they started the New Testament and they didn't want to go back to the Old Testament because somehow it connected them to Judaism. They didn't want to talk. That bothers me. Because again, the fact that Jesus lived his whole life as a Jew should connect us. And it should cut down on the anti-Semitism. But that's the audience so many is rejected. So what I got to do is teach my players, you know, kind of what that's all about. That's one of the reasons why I took my team to Israel a year ago. I wanted, we need guys. You ask anybody in Israel, what can we do? Like, what can we do? They say, come back. Come back again. Bring somebody with you. And having been like six or seven times in the last six or seven years, because I've been going at least once every year, um, it's doing really well. And they've, our people have returned to the Holy Land. God's promise is fulfilled. Um, it's in a pretty good place right now. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of real dangers around. Right now, Israel's doing really, really well. I wanted my team to be able to see that color. They couldn't believe how dark our people were, or the Israelis. That shit, they're, they're as dark as we are, coach. They had no idea. They saw the different ethnicities, all the diversity. And they, and you know, you don't, you don't have to sell them. You got to talk, you know, just go there. It's all in love with it because people... You know, we, I love Auburn. It's a great community. You know why? Part of the Auburn, people love it here. Come visit. I love You keep here, you feel that way. Same thing with Israel. Our people are so grateful for being back in the land. Um, that's why I took my team. A couple of my guys want to go back there and play someday. But now they're equipped as allies to be able to deal with some of the stuff that we see on college campuses and be able to... Uh, and I'm working right now with a group called Athletes for Israel, based in New York. In fact, I was in New York on Monday at a golf outing trying to raise some money with Daniel Posner, who runs the Athletes for Israel. We're bringing Kansas State to Arizona this year. We're also hoping to get them over to UAE for a game or two and do some sort of an Abraham course because, obviously, that whole prosperity and normalization of relations are so incredibly, incredibly important. Um, so look, that's my deal. That's my background. I look at coaching as a um, because I can't do it by myself. We have a Bible study. Um, it's not a Jewish Bible study because my guy don't pray like I do. Um, but I think it's still very important that uh, that they read their Bible, and once again, it connects us. Um, so that's pretty much my my. I guess in a nutshell, a little bit of me, the basketball coach, and me, the very grateful, patriotic, love my country, love my Jewish homeland background. Great, great story. Um, we're actually having a uh, our international convention in a few weeks, and one of our keynote speaker, his name is Eric Rubin. I know Eric. Yeah, there you go. He's doing very similar work to what you're doing. And he's taking actually uh, one of his ex-NBA players <clears throat> to convention, a uh, gentleman who played for the Knicks and now is assistant coach at Yeshiva. So it's wonderful to see the work that you guys are doing and really, you know, because the way Israel's pro portrayed in the media here even is just by certain outlets is just you you know and then you bring people over they get a whole i'm sure i know they got a whole different perspective so so wonderful so we have we have a lot of questions for you um, right. um coach thanks for being here as a proud university of florida alumnus i appreciate you leading um your team in prayer for former uf player keynote 
he notate Johnson after his medical incident on court. Speaking of U.S., what can you tell us about fellow Jew, M.O.T., man member of the tribe, and current head coach, Todd Golden, who you coached back in Israel a while back? Well, not only did I coach Todd Golden, um, but he, I had my staff here at Auburn for a couple of years. Um, and he's one of my son's very best friends. So he is, uh, I love him like a son. Um, Todd was a terrific player. We won gold in Israel together. He played over from Maccabi Haifa while he was there. Played at St. Mary's, accomplished player. Um, and uh, has done a great job coaching at San Francisco, now at Florida. He's going to get that thing back uh, where Florida has had it. I, I hope he doesn't beat me. Uh, <laughs> but he's, he probably will uh, at some point. And uh, he's a great young man great family um, and I'm hoping that Todd um, is going to um, bring his Florida team over there next year you, we're talking to John Shire but we're not just talking to Jewish coaches we're talking to other coaches like like Kansas State coach there's a big time Christian and he's excited about taking his kids back we're taking Arizona also um and if anybody wants more information for, about athletes for Israel, and you mentioned Eric Rubin, I was just with him on Monday. And wow. he's very much a part of what we're doing. And um, it'd be a cool way for some of you guys, you know, to connect. Again, uh, they took Cedric Tony over, uh, Dale Ellis, uh, Theo Ratliff, just, just about three or four weeks ago. And so they're, they're you know, they're going to be taking Charles Barkley over and his family shortly. Wow. It's good stuff. That is great. Yep. So um, I was uh, neglected to ask you the first question, which is, which is tougher to manage, the transfer portal or NIL deals slash money? The, the tremendous challenge right now is that they have both come into existence at the same time. So let's take the transfer portal. The transfer portal is a different way of, you know, transferring people, guys ask me all the time, are kids the same? Are they different? Thinking the kids are different. Kids are a little different. They're a little different, but the parents are a lot different. Uh, kids still want discipline. They still want to be coached. They still want to be held, held accountable. Parents too often when the kid's not pitching or batting forth, they just put them on a different. Can you tell that? So they can hear you? At 10 years old. And they just teach them to flee, not fight. How about throw strikes and stop switching it, swinging at bad pitches? And maybe you won't be batting ninth, like, like my father taught me. And so the parents are always way too involved trying to fix everything for them, not letting them fight, not letting them fail. Um, so what the transfer portal is this. You don't have to tell your coach. You just put your name in it. You don't have to have a meeting. You don't need any permission. Not the chairman. It was a big deal. But they call it a one-time transfer. You're eligible immediately. But unfortunately, they're not holding it to one time. All you got to do is say mental health or say, you know, something like that, and they don't touch it. And they let you be eligible right away. Look, I used to – I love transfers. And I'd bring them in, sit them out for a year, bigger, stronger, faster. They understood the system. Got caught academically. You know, they were, they were excited about playing. So sitting out is not exactly a, a penalty. Sitting out is like work on your game, work on your body. You weren't you transferred because you weren't happy with where you were. Just make it too easy. You combine that with the NIL. The, I love the name, image, and likeness because I like the fact that kids are finally able to get paid a little bit. Look, the NCAA was ignorant and arrogant. Mark Emmert made some horrendous decisions, including fighting the Ed O'Bannon case in court. That's a losing case. And as a result of losing that all over the Supreme Court, they'll never win another one. The amateur NCAA model is over. And the NCAA is the only one to blame. They should have settled with O'Bannon and paid, started paying these kids something a little bit more reasonable than just tuition, room, board, books. The money got so big in the last 20, 25, 30, 40 years. They were just slowing the trigger. Now, Toothpaste out of the tube. It's over. 
guys, there are going to be players that will get a million dollars in NIL. Not many, but some. For a top-notch college basketball five-star product, could be $500,000 a year is what some people are paying. My players, on average, this past year, we averaged about $100,000 a player, which I'm very proud of. Because I didn't have to put any of them. I said, I, I don't put them on it. The collective did not have to do any, didn't put any of our guys on it or assist any of them. But we wanted to, and we did. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, but look, that was $1.2, $1.3 million annually that we didn't exactly have budgeted. I guess um, the fact that they're both here at the same time has made it especially challenging. I don't mind either one. They've got to find a way. I'm not calling it a salary cap, but they've got to find a way to manage this better. Let's just say everybody in the power five or everyone in the league, this is about what you get for these sports. And, and uh, they've done it in major league baseball. They've done it in professional sports. We choose how the money gets distributed based on their performance. I, I don't know, but right now it's crazy. All right, so I'm going to give you a, a, a less controversial question, one that's uh, I'm sure you'll love to answer. So, Coach, what's it like coaching in the Final Four, regardless of the result of the game? Um, it's like the honor of a lifetime. There have been only five Jewish coaches in the history of college basketball to coach in the Final Four, and I'm one of them. Um, believe it or not, like Guy Lewis from Houston was Jewish, I said was he, that he didn't get a lot of publicity. Uh, Larry Brown, uh, I believe Coach Whitlack at, at, at Temple. Um, and who was the coach at uh, uh, NYU or CC? Uh, you guys would know that. Abe Saperstein. Uh, Abe Saperstein never made it to the Final Four. He was a, wasn't he the Globetrotter coach? Oh, yeah, true. Yeah. But anyways, um, it was amazing. You know, I won a Division II National Championship. I played for a Division II National Championship, finished second. But that was the, that and, and winning gold in Israel uh, in 2009, the, the greatest accomplishments as far as winning is concerned. We beat Israel in the gold medal game um, in overtime. Danny Grunfeld was my best player, Ernie's son. And the officials in the game were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We were getting screwed by my own people. So Danny Grunfeld was, uh, we had him. He's written a book. Fabulous, fabulous. Um, I have, happen to be a manager and we sell books at Harvard Cooth. And uh, so we actually featured the book. It was, it was, it's a fabulous. There was a, and we did a big uh, webinar with him. So glad to hear you mention his name. Oh, uh, he's the best. Yeah. The best. So um, we got a lot of uh, interesting questions. Uh, one of our internet, past international presidents, uh, do you think one and done is hurting the NCAA? Um, it is a little bit, um, but I'd rather have one and done than not at all. In the sense that, and I think the NBA, I don't know, we don't we don't very well, believe it or not. If anybody knows Adam Silver, I'd love to meet him. But uh, the NBA really uh, and the NCAA do not work well together. We actually compete way too much. Um, but I think that the kids, the pros are waiting out after one year in college. We do a lot to get those guys ready. And I think their value uh, is has been worth a lot more. Now, that's changing a little bit with social media. Um, you know, the big kid in France didn't necessarily need to go to college because he was a pro over there, and he established himself. Scoot Henderson is probably going to go two or three, and he was in the G League. Or, but, um, uh, yeah, look. They could study for one year and, and get out of college and get paid millions. Um, why not? Uh, and by the way, the one I've done is NBA rule. It's not an NCAA rule. They say that you can go pro one year after your high school graduating class graduates. I, I hope they don't change that and let them come out of high school, but I think they might because they don't even, the, the NBA doesn't want to let us have those kids for a year. Good luck getting those kids when they're 18 and paying them a gazillion, bajillion. You're going to have more problems than you have now. Great. So I have two um, two 
related questions, and that's about where you are in Alabama. One of our members um, was stationed in Huntsville and did not find it a very inviting place for Jews. He's curious, how is it now for being a Jewish uh, Jewish person, I guess, Jewish student? And then related to that question, is there a Hillel on campus or Chabad or what's it yep. like? Because coming from Newton, you know, it's hard to relate to Huntsville, Alabama. <laughs> well, I think there's a difference between whether it was inviting or there's just not a large Jewish community. And so therefore, there, because there isn't a large Jewish community, it's not inviting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I recognize that when I go to Israel, I'm with family. I recognize I'm with family on this call. Um, you know, one of the things I want to get back to that question, but one of the things I, I tell, I speak of the Jewish Coach Association at basketball every year, I helped start it about 20 years ago. And I tell my guys, look, guys, we got to start being louder and prouder of who we are. And our kids have got to be start being louder and prouder of who we are. I realize it's difficult to wear a yarmulke sometimes in public or, or you don't want to put your chai or your star of David outside your shirt. Uh, it'd be a lot easier for me to recruit if everybody, you know, didn't know I was Jewish. And, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just a fact. But here's what I'm saying. Our young kids have got to be proud. And, and I'll tell you why. You guys each know somebody. It's an amazing friend. Would give their right arm for you. If you were sick or you needed anything, they'd be there in a second. They're almost part of the family. They got a heart of gold. I bet you I'm talking about someone you know that's Jewish. We're some of the best friends out there. Dimensions. We don't talk about that enough. We don't brag about that enough. That's who we are. So I tell the coaches, look, go be the best assistant coach because of all the assistant coaches, the kids will come to you. You can coach them as hard as you love them. We love hard as a people. Use that in coaching. Use that in teaching. When we screw up, we take all we take all of us down. When we screw up, especially when we screw up and we add to the stereotype, that hurts everybody. Uh, and I tell my guys that the exact same thing. Let's go back to Huntsville. I love it here. I don't have a big, yes, there is the LL. The kids come to my house for Hanukkah. For Hanukkah. I make awesome potato luckies that keep hot oil. <laughs> That's uh, and um, we have we, you know, we have them over for you know Rosh Hashanah. Uh, we go to the, a local, very small synagogue. We have to rent a rabbi because we don't have one full time. It's too small a community. Probably 35, 40 families belong to the synagogue here. So there's not much Jewish life here. There isn't. But that doesn't mean it's not inviting. In this, but there just aren't a lot of us here. Um, I have found very little anti-Semitism, more so than any place I've ever been, because the evangelical Christians that are here, they love the Jewish people, they love Israel, uh, they connect, they, they've made that connection with Jesus. Do you guys know that in 1943, five years before the state of Israel is born, the state of Alabama proclaimed in a unanimous vote on both sides of the aisle that Israel should be homeland for the Jewish people and that a state should be um, uh, born. And they sent that to the president. They sent that to the United Nations. It was a, it's the it, it, Alabama was the first state to do it. So that I just think that Southern redneck KKK stuff, we don't see we don't see any of it. Great, great, great answer. Uh, hey, Mark, you want to ask some questions? 
Yeah, fuck that. Sure, I'll keep I'm sorry. I was on, I was on mute. I just saw it fast enough on the trigger there, Danny. Can you give me some warning here? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a, you know why? Because I lost it for a second. But um, <laughs> so, who do you, so the, a question came in from from Stephen Ring. Who was the greatest Jewish college ball college basketball player that you remember? Uh, and he threw a couple names out. But let's see what, what you say. Well, what is he? Who are his guys? Rosenblum, Rosen, and Rosenbluth. Ro Rosenblum and Ro Lenny Rosenblum and Rosenbluth. He has question marks about the names, but is that the names? You know those names? You know, not those are guys a little older than me. The, yeah, the one I really remember growing up was Larry Siegfried with the Celtics. There we go back to that Boston stuff again. I'm sorry, I just can't get away from it, guys. I apologize. Siegfried from Ohio State. Yeah, but he played for the Celtics. Is Lenny Rosenblum or Lenny Rosen something like that? I remember his name. So, All right. okay. Tal Brody. Tal Brody. We had him too. We love Tal Brody. We had Rest. him. Yeah. So you're hitting all the right names. <laughs> you're hitting all the right names. So, uh, so, so one of our a, yeah, there's another question more about the portal about uh, rooting. Of, uh, someone wrote a question. A couple. Prominent schools, one football, one basketball, virtually turned off their, their entire rosters because of the portal. That makes rooting more difficult. <laughs> What's your thoughts on that? You know, um, I get it that if you see somebody play for a couple of years, you develop a little different connection to them. I get it. Um, but they're still wearing your school uniform. And um, I, I get that. but. I mean, we've had a couple of one and ones like Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler, you know, a year ago. We were number one in the country for about a month. And just the fact that they stayed for one year, I mean, our fans loved them and appreciate them. And now they follow them in the NBA. So those days are gone. If those kids are good enough, they're they're going. And the game will the game will be okay without it'll be we'll be okay. We'll get another group. And as far as the transfers are concerned, yeah, it's sort of the same thing. But you got to get old. The teams in the Final Four, you know, Florida Atlantic and San Diego State, were, were Miami. They're all old teams. They got old through transfer portal. Sometimes some of those teams got old because they recruited players that weren't great players, but got old and became really good players, and they wound up winning. Okay. They're recruiting Jewish players. What's going on there? What's going on there? I've got Lior Berman is on my team. Um, and um, he uh, is from Birmingham, Alabama. And he played in the Maccabi uh, this summer. And so I do. Uh, my son is on my staff. He's Jewish. Harris Adler from uh, LaSalle was on my staff for a long time. Obviously, he was Jewish. Todd Golden. Um uh, David Benedict, the AD at UConn, hired me at uh, here at Auburn. Um, Jeff Gray is a graduate assistant of mine right now, Jewish. So if I had like two more, we could have a minion. Uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm very I'm very supportive of that. So right, well, he, also he, that yeah. So um, so we have these conventions, and you went to one of them, and one of our most involved and strongest chapters is from Sharon, Massachusetts. And one of the gentlemen that was there, that's going to be at our next convention, remembers you coming by to the table and you made quite the impact by saying hello to the guys from Temple of Israel and Sharon. So I'm sure you remember that as well, right? April 7th, 1973. That was my bar mitzvah date. And wow. uh, Cantor, Cantor Lou was... Uh, was very very special yeah i i just so grateful to have to have that foundation guys you know and we can't lose sight of that if it wasn't for my grandparents speaking yiddish and keeping kosher um if it wasn't for my parents making me go to a conservative hebrew school um uh, you know till i graduated i don't know that i would have had the foundation i that, that i have i try to my, you know, my kids know how hard we work for Israel and, and, you know, um, you know, they've all been bar mitzvahed, but 
I don't know that, you know, I've done quite the job that my, my grandparents or my parents did with us, but I encourage you all to do it. it it's, it's so important. If they don't see your leadership, um, they're not going to follow in anybody's footsteps. You're very inspirational. You got a very strong oh, group watching okay. you tonight, so I don't think you have to worry about this group. Uh, you know, I have a question for you. Um, we, listening to you talk about Athletes for Israel and looking at the website briefly while you're on this call, tell us some, some of the, a story or two of, of your athletes who went to Israel with one idea in their head and how they came home 10 days, 20 days later, whatever the trip was, and how they transformed, not just in their basketball life, but in their life in general from that. Yeah. Well, I, I think the biblical connection between the Old and the New Testament um we studied a lot about again Jesus's life and and his life as a, a a Jewish person ministering to Jewish people um just con again connecting the dots you know for them um and, and so therefore since they loved him so much and he was one of us his entire life it just connects us and then they become they become allies of him when they study the history of the old city and they recognize that between 1948 and 1967, we couldn't be walking around there. One happened, but it wasn't until Israel kind of took over. Um, we went to Bethlehem, which is in Judea. We went to Ariel University, which is in Samaria. And Ariel is the capital of that region. Um, those areas are also referred to as the West Bank. I prefer not to refer to them as the West Bank, as the world likes to. What, the West Bank and the River Jordan? 80% of the Bible, guys, was written and took place in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. To me, that doesn't make things very disputed. When I believe it was Jacob was dying and he was in Egypt, he had said to his son, he put his hand under his thigh and he said, basically, leave me here. Take me back to where my father or my family is buried. Well, that would be in Hebron. That would be at the cave of the patriarchs. That would be a place that Abraham paid extra for so nobody would ever doubt that he, didn't, that he didn't pay for it. And that's where Abraham is. That's where Sarah is. That's where Jacob is. To me, it leaves very little doubt about who that uh, belongs to. Um, there are one million Jewish people living in Judea and Samaria. There are 9 million people in the state of Israel, 6 million Jews, about 3 million Arabs. They've got their challenges, but they've worked pretty well together. You know how many Jews there are in Gaza? None. None. None anymore. You know, you, know how many, you know how many Jews there would be in a Palestinian state? Not many. None. None. So, so where exactly would the world like us to be? Where do we have their permission? Can we live in Newton? Is that okay that we can be in Newton, Mass? How about in all, Auburn, Alabama? Do I have the world's permission that I can live and coach here as a Jew? So why should they have an opinion about what 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 is what area is disputed? San Antonio's disputed. Are we going to give it back to Mexico? Only us, guys. We're the only ones that the world is allowed to have a, a conversation about where we're allowed to live. Thank Great. you. So, um, so I, um, I want to add on a positive, but I, this is a really good question and I would, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you. So this is what phone our participants this evening. He thought it was amazing the relationship that you formed with the late Great Pat Summit at Tennessee. And our participant thought that you had found a home for a long time. 
and he was very surprised when you resigned. If you don't want to talk about it, it's respectful. But did you think you received a fair shake there? <laughs> well, first of all, I didn't resign. I got fired. Okay, I got the ziggy. So, <laughs> I did not. I did not resign. And I. And oh, by the way, the last ten times I played Tennessee at Auburn, I'm eight and two. But who keeps who? Who keeps yeah, track? Who's counting, right? <laughs> I punish them every time I play them for firing me. Um, no, I, I didn't get a fair shake. They 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 bailed on me. Uh, made made some mistakes, but. Nothing that warranted in my mind. Uh, I had a couple of kids over the house and, and we had a barbecue. They weren't supposed to be there. And then I made the mistake in an interview, not telling the truth about it. And right after that interview, I went back, told my coaches, we all went in there. We all lied. We got, we're going to get caught in this lie. And I called them back right away. They said I got fired for lying. I didn't get fired for lying. I got fired when I came back and tried to tell the truth. But by then it was too late. Anyways, that was phenomenal. The best. Incredible person, incredible executive, great teacher. Um, um, she, uh, she always gave me credit for this. She said, Bruce, you've made me about $2 million. I said, Pat, how, how did I make you $2 million? She said, well, when you first got to Auburn, I was making more than you. And you started winning. And for the first couple of years, there's no way they were going to be paying you more than me. I'm Pat Summit. But after about two or three years and a couple of championships, if they wanted to keep me, there's no way they, so they started paying me a lot more than Pat. They raised her salary as well. <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, I love these uh, questions, the last, the next two, um, and they're related. Did you ever want to be an NBA coach? And oh, by the way, Fred Auerbach was Jewish and you were a Boston Celtics fan growing up, weren't you? Absolutely. So, okay. So uh, so the question is, to, do you or did you ever want to really, you know, play in the, uh, be, be a coach with the NBA? Well, NBA? I used to, the B'nai Brits, you know, you know, Eddie Andelman and, 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 and uh, Red would come and speak and I was just in awe of him. Knew all the songs. Um, Sam Jones lived in our hometown. Um, when I got fired at Tennessee, um, Mark Cuban, this huh. never got. Um, and uh, Donnie Walsh, Donnie Donnie Nelson, Donnie Nelson, Don Nelson's son. Donnie was the general manager of the Dallas Mavericks. They brought me down there, <laughs> and they said. Coach Pearl, we'd like you to coach our G League team for a couple of years. And then if you do, we'll bring you up to coach with Coach Carlisle as an assistant. And then who knows where you're going to go from there. Pretty good, pretty good deal. And I said to him, I said, look, let me be on Carlisle's bench for one year. And then I promise to go down and coach your G League team but you don't have to ever bring me back if you don't want to. What I wanted to do is I wanted to be an assistant for a year. And I wanted to um, um, learn the game a little bit from him. That was the organization. But they wanted me badly as the head coach to sell tickets and do things like that. And so I didn't do it. But I did have a chance. I think I'm better off in the college game because you guys can see from just this little time we've had together. It's not just about the game. It's not just about sports. It's about life. And, um, and I pour into my kids. Um, and I don't know that this works as well at the NBA level. Well, you're very inspirational. Um, David uh, texted me my third chair and, He's just, uh, we're all in awe of listening to you and hearing you. And, you know, we have more conventions every other year. So maybe you'd come back. We're going to Chicago in two years. So uh, we'd love to hear you. It was fabulous, fabulous. So, uh, David, you want to? Uh, sure. Um, I'd like to thank Danny Mando, my coach here, and my IT Mavens, Rick Ronsberg, Stan Greenspan, <laughs> and Mark Ivers, because I can't do it without these guys. 
And I really want to thank uh, Coach Bruce Perot because this was incredible. We've had many, we've had many speakers and absolutely one of the best we've ever had. Um, I am a real big basketball fan. So for me to listen to you and the stories about Sharon, about Boston, about Auburn, Alabama, it, it was just inspiring. I understand why young men want to play on your team because you are a motivator. There is no doubt in my mind that you are just a really, you're a one of a kind coach. And I'm really, really and honored by the fact that you were here tonight. And that's not something I say very lightly as these guys know, so I've, we've had a lot, we've had a lot of speakers, but absolutely incredible. I'm really, really happy that you were here. And uh, I just want to thank you. That's all I have to say. Listen, my, David, my pleasure. And again, part of the reason why I wanted to be able to come on and, and visit with you guys, is just encouraging you guys to continue what you're doing, continue to stay connecting, continue to lead, you know, carrying you to, to wear it on your sleeve. Um, and um, I just, I just want to, I want to encourage you. Um, you guys, we got, we have a lot to be proud of and, um, but we do represent. And, and so with that, you know, comes a lot of responsibility. So let the light continue to shine upon you and uh, be gracious to you. Okay. Um, and if I can ever do anything for you, holler at me. We play in Brooklyn uh, in the Barclays uh, the week before Thanksgiving. So for those of you that are too far from Brooklyn, come see us. Um, you, we can connect through email. And if there's anything I can do to help, don't hesitate to call me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Danny, okay. I just want Danny to finish up about a little plug about convention and then we're going to end it. So we'll see, we'll see everyone in five weeks in uh, downtown Philadelphia. And um, we, we're really looking forward to it. We, uh, we have already achieved our goal of 350 and it continues and uh, can't wait. So thank you very much. And uh, Bruce, keep up the good work. You're Shikala. And hawks and mask, everyone. Hawks and mask, that's right. Hawks and mask, right. Thank you, coach. Coach, is there anything that we can do to support the work that you're doing with the with the coaches group? Um, you know what? There's uh, the the coaches association. We don't I, I, the the athletes for Israel. If you would like to support athletes for Israel, yes, you absolutely can. I just go online, um, read about Daniel Posner and what he's doing. There's a way to reach out to him or Eric Rubin. And yeah, we do. I mean, we need funding to be able to continue to take teams over there and athletes. And, and, and look, I can tell you, everything that you give is going to go to, is going to be going to, to sending somebody, help sending somebody over there or the programming. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a good it's night. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thank, you thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. And nice, Coach. Thank you.